Welcome everybody to your first breakout session. This session is Waterfront Properties and Native Plants with our speaker, Clay Morris. Clay Morris is the National Resources Section Chief for Prince William County Environmental Services. He received his undergraduate degree in environmental studies from Shenandoah University and his master's in biology from the University of North Carolina, Wil Wilmington. He is an avid gardener with interest in permaculture, regenerative agriculture, and restoration ecology. He is responsible for implementing the county's Chesapeake Bay Preservation Act ordinances, particularly in regards to resource protection areas. So as you can imagine, his talk today will be about preserving and improving the riparian areas around the county's streams and rivers. And with that, I will turn it over to your presenter, Clay Morris. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for um, taking part in this presentation today and also taking part in this symposium. Uh, I did want to say that this is our third year of doing this symposium. And um, though the first year it, uh, began with basically a group of about 100 people, it was uh, restricted by the size of the venue that we could have. Uh, last year, we had it at the Northern Virginia Community College Training Center. We had over 250 people. And this year, of course, with COVID, we had to sort of switch gears and go virtual. But again, I really appreciate all of you uh, taking part of this. I hope next year you will attend. Uh, we all get to meet in person. As I mentioned today, I am, um, I am responsible for implementing the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Act ordinances for Prince William County. If you're familiar with, or if you're from Northern Virginia, then you're most likely going to be in one of the counties that have these ordinances. So what that means is there's a lot of emphasis on protecting our perennial water bodies, our, our perennial streams and rivers. One of the things that we have done is um, implemented the RPA, the Resource Protection Area, which is a hundred foot buffer on all perennial streams. But even if you aren't affected by that, there's just a lot to be said about really protecting our streams. And one of the best ways to do that is to have a lot of vegetation along our streams. So the topic today is going to be, here's going to work, or you're going to see a lot, is riparian. Now, I don't know if any of you are big fans of British comedies, but there is a very famous one called Keeping Up Appearances of which a whole episode is devoted to riparian entertainments. So if you ever get a chance to see Keeping Up Appearances, I highly recommend it. Um, it's, it's quite funny. But the, um, the whole purpose of riparian, let's define it first, is it means it's relating to or situated along the banks of a river or a stream. Uh, if we define it ecologically, it's the interface between the land and a river or a stream. It's that buffer between where the two interact. So the one affects the other. And then of course, any vegetation within that riparian area is called the riparian buffer. Now I am a restoration ecologist. I find ecology just absolutely fascinating. And I really find riparian areas to be so because you can have uplands or terrestrial systems and you can have aquatic systems. But what I really find fascinating and where there's just an amazing interaction between the two is in this riparian area. And here's some of the reasons. So first, let's take a look at the picture on the um, right. This is basically a, a riparian areas actually got a lot of interest first from the agricultural. They realized that growing crops while protecting Play. water. Yes. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but you have not shared your, your screen yet. OK, how do I do that, Mike? Down at the bottom, click on the green share screen. I thought you were still giving a little bit of an introduction. I'm sorry. Oh, hold on. Um, share screen. Share screen. Okay, I'm still not seeing it, Mike. Uh, then you collect. Then you select oh. your PowerPoint oh, slide. I'm sorry. I thought I was sharing the screen. That's oh. okay. There we go. All right. Let's. No. Can you put it in presenter mode by up at the top? Yeah, I did that. It shows it on my computer. There you go. You got it. Oh, okay. All right. Sorry, folks. That's okay. So um, let's go back. All right. So uh, again, so riparian, these are some of the pictures that we're interested in. And um, as I mentioned, the it's the interface between the two. 
And so here's, here's so the, the slide we were going to be on. So the picture on the right is basically taken from typical agricultural model. And it was sort of early on that they were realizing that agricultural uses were affecting water quality. So a lot of times these pictures and these models that you see are um, agricultural related, but we've also learned through the development process that development also has an impact on the streams. So back to the whole functions and values of the riparian area is the riparian area is really important for a number of reasons. The first and foremost is probably going to be soil conservation because they realized that a lot of the soil that was leaving from the classic agricultural model of plowing and tilling and bare soil when the rain hits, and of course the goal was to optimize your planting area. So unfortunately the forest often bore the brunt of that. So of course go straight to the edge of the stream. Well, then all that soil would leave and enter into the streams. A fascinating fact, if you're from Prince William County is that the whole, um, a lot of Quantico, I'm sorry, not necessarily Quantico, but Dumfries, the, um, the, the town of Dumfries at one time was one of the most important um, ports along the Eastern seaboard. Well, I don't know if you've been near Dumfries lately, but you'd be lucky if you could get a sea, if you'd be lucky if you get a canoe up into those bodies of water because the early agriculture really silted in and caused a lot of sediment to enter into those water bodies. So we've learned that by having a buffer of vegetation, you intercept a lot of that soil from leaving the, um, leaving the site and staying in place and protecting our water bodies. The next thing is habitat. And habitat is, um, of course, places for things to live, to get the things they need. Of course, water is a critical element. And there are a lot of uh, animals and creatures that sort of need both. They need access to the forest, but they also have an aquatic lifestyle. So something to really think about is having a diverse habitat. So you need the canopy, you need the shrub layer, you need the herbaceous layer, not just for wildlife, but also then in order to, for soil conservation, every one of those plants has a root system and that root system does a really major job in keeping all the soil in place from falling into the stream. The probably the more biotic aspect of the riparian area is the influence that it has on the ecosystems. So, of course, streams flood. So, a lot of the nutrients and sediments that are carried in, in that stream get redeposited back onto the land. You know, this is a, a classic thing, particularly in some of the great civilizations like the, like the Egyptians and the Babylonians were really reliant upon those periodic inputs of nutrient-rich soils back onto the land. There is a lot of life going on within a stream that needs an organic input. We're going to talk about some of those in a little bit, but the leaf litter, the sticks, the branches, the different things that fall into the water then support a lot of the fish and insect species that are in the water. And then shading. Water can get a little too warm. A lot of, in, uh, a lot of fish species in particular have um, a heat intolerance. So nice, cool, clean water. The more um, that you have that, then the more life you can support. So for, you know, me and the resource protection area, one of the really big ways to protect our water bodies and what we really need to stop is soil erosion. For streams, the reason, ero now again, erosion is a natural process. If somebody were to say, is erosion good or bad? Well, the argument could be made, well, it's natural. It's, you know, it's kind of a trick question. The problem is excessive erosion. And the reason that erosion can be bad for a stream is that it destroys the in-stream habitat. Most streams around here have a very rocky bottom. There's a lot of spaces, a lot of places for things to hide. But the problem is, is when soil moves into those spaces, they get filled and therefore you lose the habitat. If you're next to a lake or a pond, and um, the real problem is, is that you lose volume. As that material gets, moves in, it displaces the amount of water. You know, somebody once said that ponds or lakes are destined to die because that's just the natural process is that the soil material moves into it. And unless we do something man-made, such as a very costly dredging, then eventually that system is going to, um, you know, gonna go away. So on the left, you see just how incredibly good tree roots are at retaining. 
and they really keep stuff in place. Um, and then the other goal that we want to achieve is if we, in the lack of having tree roots is we want to intercept things. So you have the manicured turf. I consider manicured turf to be just this side of pavement when it comes to imperviousness or the ability to sort of stop material from moving across it. So what you really want to have is some sort of buffer, some sort of root structure in there to provide something we call roughness. Roughness is a sort of a physics thing where you have a fast moving flow of water. It hits something that disturbs and dissipates that energy. The sediments fall out further away from the water body. So the goal is to either retain or to intercept the soils and plants are really good at doing that. A little bit more on soil erosion. Again, it is natural. There are two types of um, natural erosion, particularly in the water body. There's the channel flow. So if you have a stream, water's moving through the stream, storms come up, you know, the water gets up, gets some strength and some erosion happens. And then also wave action, that's a little bit more typical for sort of a water body. Wind blows across the lake, the water laps along the edges. These are all natural processes. Where we have a problem is when it's unnatural, particularly the top picture where you see manicured turf right to the edge of a stream. So any water that falls particularly then flows downhill, it gains velocity. It comes across these unprotected soils. You can see a lot of the bare soil there. The water hits that and then just very rapidly erodes and you can see the roots and all the things. They tried, you know, they tried their best to intercede some of that flow. But if there was a way to dissipate that energy before it even got there, then you have a much better system of, of preventing some of those erosive flows. And uh, the problem with sheet flow is, um, is it has a lot to do with our just urban desire to have green lawns. You know, unfortunately, the, the, it seems like the mantra, you know, springtime, I just dread it because I see just these cartloads of fertilizer. And I think the general idea is that if one bag works good, two bags works better. And fertilizer doesn't work that way. So I highly recommend for your lawns to get your soils tested and to have a nutrient management plan created. Um, Cooperative Extension Service provides this activity or it will provide this for you because the soil can only, based upon the chemistry of your soil, it can only take up a particular amount of nitrogen. Um, Fertilizer is expensive, but what the nutrient management plan will do is it'll tell you exactly how much to put down and when to put it down. Therefore, we don't end up with these excesses, which then wash into the pond or the stream. Because you can see in the, lo the lower picture, you can see what happens. Uh, we get algal blooms. So, I, you know, I used to get this call from a couple of water bodies, the lake's turning green, what are you going to do about it? And then I would tell them, no, here's what you're going to do about it. And so it's, it started some kind of conversations because all this fertilizer ends up in, then what happens is it causes, you know, algae loves fertilizer just as much as grass does. So it really gets to growing. What also happens, unfortunately, in lakes and in ponds is because, especially in the warm weather, without any sort of movement, you get um, stratification. So you'll get these very warm areas. And those very warm areas really will spur algal growth. And algae is a living thing. It lives, it dies. In the process of decomposition, it uses up the available oxygen. So therefore, there's no oxygen for all the other aquatic creatures in there, like the fish. So oftentimes, you'll end up with fish kills. So it's really, really important to keep these fertilizers, to keep this managed turf and the things that we're putting down on, keep them away from the water. And one way to do that is to establish a nice riparian buffer. Now let's get a little bit more into the biology of it. The, um, so typically, even in a garden, in forest structure, anything, there's different layers of it. There's the canopy, which is sort of the upper canopy, the, the bigger trees, the oaks, and the hickories and the much larger trees. And then underneath that is the mid story. Sometimes you'll see the word called sub canopy. And this is an area of trees that can kind of grow under the shade of the larger trees. Then there's the understory, the shrubs, and then the ground layers, any of the herbaceous stuff. And this picture on the right shows some of the different bird species that are, you know, they're pretty much they they exist in these areas and it's pretty amazing how very well they are sort of defined by it so the more diverse of a a, 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 a habitat you have 
then the much more wildlife you can support. And that's gonna get me to the point of, in ecology, there's something called the diversity hypothesis. And what this means is the greater variety, the greater, greater resiliency. So the more things you have, and this goes for trees, this goes for trophic levels, it goes for food sources and different plants, the more varieties of things that you have, if something happens to one of those species, then there are other species that can fill that niche. This is really kind of important for pollinator species, uh, particularly for different insects that can, you know, we're kind of will go amongst a couple of different pollinator sources. So if something happens to that one particular plant, there are other plants to sort of fill that niche and kind of take up that lack. So again, the whole idea, let's have much more just structurally in, um, diverse habitat, but then also, diversity within what we're putting within that area. Back to the whole um, importance of the riparian area. Again, I, I really love the riparian area because of not only does it serve both an upland function and it can support birds, it also has a lot to do and influence within the particular water bodies. We mentioned the importance of shade, having nice cool water temperatures really is important. Trout, um, not that we're going to have trout too much in Northern Virginia, but um, there are some areas as you, as you start getting more up into the Piedmont that they have, been, there's been work with really trying to get these shadier streams so that we can increase the range of, sh of trout. But again, even just a lot of our darter species and a lot of our game fishes like those cooler waters, they like the shade, it gives them, uh, provides them with additional protection also. And then so and just the natural part of trees dropping branches into the water body you have places for things to hide you have places for things to grow up and to mature and the more cover that you give them then you end up with bigger fish so if you have a lake and your goal is to have nice fishing uh, bigger fish then provide them structure give them places to hide and grow up so they have an opportunity to do that the riparian area is a place, it's a system of inputs. So it's doing a couple of things. First thing is it is preventing soil and erosion from washing up above it. It's preventing that from actually entering the water body. That's really important as we mentioned because what we're trying to do is keep the, the water body itself, particularly the, the, the lower parts, the, the, set, or the, uh, the rocky bottom with all those spaces, we're trying to keep those areas free. And then we're also just trying to get some leaves and branches and logs in there because it's a whole slew of, of aquatic insects. We call them aquatic macroinvertebrates that a lot of insect, well, not a lot, but many insect species begin their lives in the water. Dragonflies, damselflies, but some of the much lesser known creatures start their, their larval stage in the water and then they emerge and they become terrestrial species. Now, these are, we're going to talk about trophic levels is the shredders the scrapers there's the predators so all this leaf material is falling into the water so you have a group of insects in there you know big leaves though big needs leave to be, need to be broken down in order for them to be of more use so you have these shredders these particular insects that are solely devoted to sort of tearing and shredding these plants and making them into much smaller bits the quicker that you tear something down, then the more available it is to other species. So then you have the scrapers. This is another group that is eating on the algae or they're catching li the little bits of the leaf and they're, they're using that to eat. And then of course, there's the predators who are eating the shredders and the scrapers. The insects that we're seeing below, there's, there's a numerous aquatic macroinvertebrate um, families but there's some really, they're very important in terms of judging water quality. So some of the samplings that we use to test and to check the health of a water body is we look at the macroinvertebrate community. There's three groups that we really look for. They're called Ephemeroptera, Trichoptera, and Plecoptera, the EPT taxa. And these particular groups are really sensitive to, um, to water quality. So we look for those. And so one of, the, one of the particular insects that you see right now on the left, this is, a, um, this is called a stonefly. This is of the group Plecoptera. 
they, uh, they're one of the shredders. They love to get pieces of leaves and tear them up and into little bits. The group in the middle is the, um, is called the trichopter. And this is probably one of my favorite groups. These are the caddis flies. If, if you're looking at that, it looks like there are little pebbles on it. Well, that's exactly what it is. It has taken little bits of pebbles. It has glued them together and it's made itself a little hideaway. It carries that around with it. So it's protected by these little stones. It's made this little case and it walks around. There's another group of these caddis flies that actually create little nets and they catch material flowing down the stream and they catch this material and they eat it. Um, I, they're just fascinating. So there's another group that will take sticks and make like a little log cabin around themselves. Just a fascinating group of, of insects. I don't have a picture of ephemeropter, which is the mayflies but that sort of rounds out our trifecta of EPT taxa. What we do have there though, however, is a Helgamite, and I put it there just for shock value because it's really ugly, um, but it's really you know fascinating. It's one that the kids always get really excited about because they're very aggressive. Of course, they are a predator, but these, all of these insects are vitally important to the health of the stream. They tell us a lot about the health of the stream. They serve as food sources for both the fish and then when they emerge, then they're also a food source for birds. Now, as I mentioned earlier, if you are Fairfax, Prince William County, Stafford County, you have resource protection area ordinances. The goal of those is to protect the, um, what was all part of a strategy that counties adopted as part of the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Act, which was enacted back in the late 1980s. For, and the reason that the county adopted this is because it, it's, a, it's a major tool. Now we have a lot of different ways to do it, but it was one of the really major tools that the counties adopted in order to help achieve these rather lofty goals of trying to restore the Chesapeake Bay. In general, what it requires is a hundred foot buffer on both sides of a perennial water body. Now perennial water bodies in a very general sense are those that have water flowing through them constantly. There is a criterion, there is a study, studies that are done to sort of determine that. But once a stream is, is found to be perennial, then we put this 100 foot buffer on it. And it's very restrictive, um, typically. It, the goal for it is to be fully vegetated and it's to remain undisturbed. So there are different processes in the site and plan development that first thing you do is we look at the RPA. There are certain activities we'll get to in a minute. But again, let's get back to the whole, it, you know, it's not, the purpose of the RPA is a very pragmatic and imperial, empirical thing to do. The goal is to intercept sediment, fertilizers, and chemicals, and also just to sh prevent shoreline erosion. So many times people will go through, they'll remove all the vegetation because they want to see the water, but then the process, they've removed one of those critical elements. Remember, roots are, do an amazing job of keeping soil in place, and plants do an amazing job of intercepting those erosive flows just some sort of the nuts and bolts of, of RPA in terms of regulations, there are a couple of things called exempt activities and permitted uses. So if you have RPA in your property, you're allowed to access it. Of course, we want you to enjoy the river. It's an amenity for you. And so you can access it minimally, you know, a, a nice um, a path down there. It doesn't need to be a grand alley down to the stream. You can walk down there, you have access to it and that's allowed. You're allowed sight lines. If you need to do a little selective pruning, of course you bought waterfront property, you wanna be able to see it. Um, please don't expect an unobscured view for it. There's no really neat reason to do that. A couple of trees in front of your window, you know the water body's still going to be there, but by having, just doing some selective pruning instead of removing the entire vegetation, you can still enjoy that body of water. And of course, passive recreation, you know, get down there, take your boat down there and enjoy that property. Um, you can have walk, you, there can be trails along through the riparian buffer because we want you to get down there and enjoy that. So the whole point of this goal is to get people excited and encouraged to, to restore. If you have riparian areas, um, doesn't even have to be RPA. You can have a very small stream along your water body, but the whole goal is to get you to, to consider native plants in the process of improving that area. So a number of ways to do that. Again, let's remember our goals. We're trying to, we're trying to stop runoff. We 
trying to keep water that's landing on the land from quickly flowing down and ending up in our streams and causing erosive flows. And we're also trying to stop some of the chemicals and the fertilizers and the pesticides that we're using on our lawns from entering the water body because they can be very detrimental in there in a numerous ways. Now, there are some challenges, particularly in some heavily developed areas or older developed areas where the riparian buffer has been impacted and removed. This happens a lot in sort of older developments and uh, sometimes there's a lack of suitable soil the soil has been so eroded and so washed away. Typically soils along the streams, particularly if they get periodic flooding are very rich soils. They, they get these impact, this, this flooding of water puts a lot of very rich soils, but unfortunately, if there's nothing holding that in place, then it just all washes back into the stream. So sometimes the soils, soils can be very poor. Uh, prior agricultural use, that's another example where the soils, the really richer soils have been washed away. And a really big problem around here is non-native and invasive species. We have a, a large number of non-native invasive plants that are very good at out-competing. So that's something that kind of can be, become a perpetual battle, or if nothing else, it's early on before you start your restoration. You want to get in there and remove those non-native invasive plants so that your, the native stuff that you're going to plant actually has a chance. There is an expense to doing this. Um, you know, sometimes if you want a quick and um, satisfying result, it's going to cost money. It's trees can be rather expensive, particularly if you go for larger stock. And then, um, of course, you can go with the smaller species, the smaller stock, which are going to take a little bit longer, but can be much more affordable. It also can be depends on are you planting ten or do you have to plant a hundred. So those are sort of some of the things that people have to think about in terms of, of restoring um, any kind of reforestation or re repairing restoration. The biggest thing and the biggest challenge that I'm faced with, particularly when I'm talking to people about how to manage their riparian areas is a, is a personal aesthetic that they have. They, a lot of people want this very manicured look and particularly when there's a water body to be seen, they have these visions of these vistas that they're trying to achieve. And that can be hard to deal with because, you know, you look in a magazine and you see all the pretty pictures and you see all the pretty colors and stuff. Um, but so much of that species are, are not native. And the whole goal of not just this presentation, but of this entire symposium and why we're doing this is to introduce people to the whole idea of the value and the beauty of native plants that we have here. And not just because of the beauty, but in terms of the lack of care that you have to give them, they, they are acclimated to be here. So they generally have fewer care requirements. Um, there's a lot of, a, a lot of reasons to go natural and still achieve sort of the aesthetic that you want. But sometimes we need to maybe kind of think about how to, um, how to achieve that, which might require a shift in our aesthetic sensibilities. So, you know, why, what are we trying to do with this? Why are we trying to restore the riparian area? And what we're really trying to do is recreate a native forest community. And if we really think about what that looks like, it's a dense vegetative cover, native plants, ground cover, leaf litter. Um, for some reason, people have a real aversion to leaves. Leave them in place. They're serving a natural function. They're a natural fertilizer, so leave them in place. Because what happens is when we leave that material in place, we the soil develops and that material slowly breaks down. Basically, it creates almost like a sponge. We call it duff or, or humus. And it's really important. So remember, the goal is to keep water from flowing off the land and into the stream at a high rate of speed. Well, by having that very thick duff layer, that humus layer, then we're basically creating a sponge. And so all that rainwater is getting into the system and it's almost like a reservoir. It sits there and then it's slowly available to all the other species and different things are trying to grow there. So our goals, uh, develop a permeable soil with high organic content, back to that sponge idea, really create a nice soil that we can use to, um, to soak up the rainwater. We're trying to intercept that overland flows. And let's not forget that we really want that diversity of plant species across all trophic layers because more diversity, more layers, 
then more um, more insects, bugs, birds that we can introduce to our habitat. So I'm going to run through a couple of these are some of my favorite species and uh, that are, are really good for riparian. I, I, I'm an avid gardener. I have my own aesthetic it actually honestly has required me to sort of get out of my formal training and be a little bit more natural. So some of these are going to be very pretty and there's going to be a reason for that because I suspect you're trying to do the same thing. Uh, here's red maple, Acer rubrum, the foliage. It's hard to beat in the fall. I mean, this, that's absolutely you know, glorious. Uh, tolerant of periodic flooding and wet soils. Uh, an extensive root system. So they do an amazing job of really kind of getting into those spaces and really holding the soil. They, uh, they like full sun and they like ample moisture. So if you have one of those streams that periodically floods or, um, you know, it's one of those that you can get much closer to the water and it's gonna be perfectly happy. Uh, next, some of the canopy trees. So these are the big guys, uh, sycamore or platinus occidentalis, uh, seasonal interest. That white bark is so striking. And I really love going along a river where you see a, a lot of those in the winter time because they're really just a very striking plant. They love riparian environments. They're very happy right at the edge of a river. They have these amazing root systems, as you can see, that really do a great job of keeping everything in place. River birch, this is another canopy tree, though oftentimes on the smaller side, you'll see a lot of these around lakes, uh, like uh, Lake Montclair. Um, they have a lovely seasonal interest, as you can see by the bark. They like periodic inundation. Oftentimes they're gonna be right at the very edge of the, of the, of the bank. Multi-stemmed, so they have uh, you know, a little bit bushier, a little bit different structure and architecture than say the maple or the sycamore. And they, they will, they're clonal, so they will spread, their root system will spread, and then you'll start getting additional trunks off of that root system, which is kind of a, you know, plant one, get 10 in the end, which is always a nice thing to do with plant material. There's the American beech, uh, Fagus grandifolia. This one is one that is more of an upland species. It's gonna be a little, it likes to be a little higher. It's not gonna to be too happy about its feet too wet though. It, it'll tolerate to some degree. That seasonal interest, that smooth bark. You see a lot of this in Prince William County. And uh, it's a, a, a great source for wildlife food. Uh, the berries, I'm sorry, the nuts that it grows uh, are really popular with a lot of birds and supports a lot of caterpillar species. Now we're going to get um, into the sub canopy, the understory, which sometimes can be a bit more of a challenge, but there are some really amazing plants. Um, one, my all time favorite is pawpaw. It's Asamina triloba. Uh, it's uh, the wildlife love it. And the reason you'll see is because that fruit in the middle. If you have never had pawpaw, I highly recommend it. It looks tropical, tastes like banana custard. It's truly a unique plant. Um, it's a very Actually, it's the only member of its family this far north. It is a much more tropical species, or at least family-wise, but it's just an amazing plant. The flowers are otherworldly. You can see them on the left. They're actually uh, in threes, which is very unusual for a lot of plants. The leaves, even though this is a sub-canopy tree, the leaves are huge uh, oftentimes because they are living in this sort of shady area, so they have to they have to use this mechanism in which to catch a lot of sunlight. So the way they do that is have these very large leaves. So they, uh, but again, a really nice understory plant in a particularly shady area. Uh, my my perennial favorite in terms of springtime. Nobody does spring like Virginia, and so my favorite has got to be redbud, uh, Circus canadensis. The spring color is just. People like dogwoods, I'll take a red bud any day, just because of just that mass of color that you can get. They have an incredible architecture, very you know, sort of elegant. They're a smaller tree, but they just have a, in, in, in mass, they just really are uh, something unique. They do prefer edges. Oftentimes you'll see them growing in fence rows. This is one where you say you have your house and you have your lawn and then you have your riparian area. This is gonna be the one that you're gonna to wanna to put between the lawn and those taller trees because in the springtime, you're gonna to want to see this plant. You're gonna to wanna to have it close to you and really enjoy it. Next is American holly. I'm always a big fan of having something to green, look green to look at in the wintertime. So when I look out into the woods behind my house, I planted hollies just to sort of break it up. 
Also, um, we're feeding the birds, so it's a great wildlife food plant. And again, this is going to be one of those that has like a, as an upland. So if you have sort of a slope down to your water you're, and you have drier conditions, this holly is going to be a nice plant for you to plant. Uh, Subcanopy sassafras, sassafras albidum. Again, another upland one, very shade tolerant. That fall color, it's a different palette. It's going to be one of those more orangey colors. They tend to be rather clonal, so they're going to spread. They're not going to get very tall. So this is a really interesting and pretty plant to consider. Shrubs. Um, we have some gorgeous ones here. Probably the most striking one, I think, and there's a lot of these around Lake Montclair's mountain laurel, Calmia latifolia. It is evergreen, so that's a big plus. It's shade tolerant and it's an upland plant. So it really likes those uh, sort of drier conditions and more acidic soils. Uh, if you have a, a much wetter condition, so you have a pond or sort of a muckier, swampier area, button bush is hard to beat. Cephalanthus occidentalis, again, it's a wetland plant. It wants wet feet. Um, again, around ponds and swamps, uh, it provides seeds for ducks and other sort of aquatic birds. It's also a nectar source for bees. And then there's also the Titan and the hydrangea sphinx moss. Uh, the one you see there is a hydrangea moth, I believe. And so feeds the birds, feeds the insects, and really a, a, a unique kind of almost otherworldly plant. Another one of my big favorites is a sumac uh, for a number of different reasons. It's an ed species. It likes dry conditions. The, that's hard to beat that fall color. It's colony forming, so it's another one. Plant one, get 10, or plant 10, get 100. So if you have an area that you want to kind of take over, I don't think I've ever seen these really get above 10 feet, but they, uh, they have a very, uh, a very nice kind of stature and, and a lot of interest. Multiple uses. Uh, the seeds are eaten by birds and wildlife. I'm a big forager. I really enjoy a lot of wild plant foods. So you can take the berries and you can actually make a tasty lemonade out of it. So you know, this is a win-win and something for everybody. Another perennial uh, perpetual favorite for me is elderberry, Sambucus canadensis. Uh, very dramatic flowers, these, these big umbels, as you can see, they'll be as big as your hand, if not bigger. It's a, has the plant itself, it's a bush, it's a shrub, so it's kind of a bushier plant. Another one of those that it's going to, if you prune it, it's going to respond by sending up more. I always like that about plants. I like buying one and then having it give me more. I've taken stem cuttings from the elderberry bushes that I have. They root very quickly, so this is one that you can propagate very easily. Another edge species, they often like open fields or edge of woods where they can kind of get a little bit of sunlight. They don't need a lot, but they, um, well, it's, it's a nice one. Another one of those edge ones where you're going to want to have it in that interface between the manicured turf and then the riparian area. All kinds of things eat those berries. It's, um, and I don't know, it's quite the health craze now for elderberry syrups. Uh, has been a in the last couple of years has become a very big um, health craze in terms of the herbal community and it's a pollinator favorite those flowers those umbels the size of them they just beckon to every solitary bee that's out there so another really great choice and let's not forget the herbaceous layer there's just a huge number of herbaceous plants and i'm going to give you a link at the end of this to to sort of spell out a lot of those but let's not forget the herbaceous layer because all the pollinators that really are dependent upon this, having a really healthy, even if it's 10 feet around a stormwater management pond, it, it will, will do a lot to keep things from washing into the pond. And, um, and that's really what we're trying to do here is, is keep, it seems strange to say, is to keep water out of our pond. What, what, we're not trying, what we're trying to do is to get clean water into our streams. That's the goal. And so we have to sort of, the whole point of the riparian buffer is to create this area, sort of this filter so that the water that leaves the land ends up in the stream, but when it does, it's nice and clean. There's a huge diversity. And also it's a very effective goose deterrent. If you're having issues with ponds and bodies of water and you're having a lot of geese, by having a, a, a healthy herbaceous layer that's, um, geese don't like to, 
leave the water and have to go through something that they can't see. They want to get to your lawn, but if there's a lot of this growth and a lot of stuff that they have to get through, they're very uh, reluctant to do that because there's a predator in there or they think there's a predator in there. So a really good way to kind of, uh, particularly for ponds and lakes, is to deter geese is or from at least coming onto the land is to have a healthy uh, herbaceous layer that they can't see through because they just think um, somebody's in there waiting for them and they're often reluctant to leave it. Um, uh, I would like you to take a look at this link. Please write it down. As we mentioned, all of these are going to be recorded and distributed to you. So you know, don't worry about it. You can go back and find this. Uh, Plant Nova natives is an invaluable group in the, count, in, in the Northern Virginia. Um, I, by all means, check out their website. And in particular, this is a list that has been created by Margaret Fisher there, who has very painstakingly gone through the trees, the canopies, the subcanopies, and the herbaceous layer, um, and has come up with a lot of uh, suggestions, growing conditions, and that sort of thing so that uh, it can really give you a lot of good guidance in, in just in general and just native plants overall. Uh, at this point, I'd like to thank you. And I'm gonna, I think we have some time for some questions. So I'm gonna turn it over to Mike. And do you have any questions for me, Mike? Uh, so our first question, what are your favorite sources for, for purchasing native plants? And I'd like to add to that, Clay, of can you speak about the local ecotypes versus non-local ecotypes? Also, oh. I'm putting Clay's link in the chat box for those that would like to copy it. Okay. Um, well, I think in terms of sources, there's you know, any number. I think what really need, and there are a lot of, so Earth Sangha is uh, E-A, Earth Sangha, S-A-N-G-H-A is a local group that is has done an amazing job of of creating nursery stock for uh, for for any kind of native plant species um, a lot of the nurseries are getting better at getting natives um, any though off, no matter what nursery you go to you're still going to find that the native species are often much fewer than all the non-native species. But again, this is all market driven. But that being said, really go to your favorite nursery. And you know, I have favorite nurseries and I just say, hey, get this for me. And if enough of us do that, then, then, the, then the market system will work and all of our nurseries will start competing and having the best stock. So I live over though, I'm near Winchester, Virginia. So probably the nurseries, nurseries that I have available to me are going to be different than what you have. I do, I have found Meadows Farms to be very accommodating. I have a Meadows Farms here. I know you have plenty there. They have been accommodating. If they can't, if they don't have it, they'll get it for me. Um, and I think in terms, if in ecotypes, are you talking, um, if you're talking about cultivars and nativars, as mentioned, go for the, go for the purest version that you can get. Um, just, you know, cultivars, they're often bred for differing things other than their natural function. So I, I'm, I think if, if I'm understanding the question properly, try to go as pure as you can. Okay. Thank you, Clay. Um, you can also contact your local soil and water conservation district uh, and they can provide you with local uh, native plant nurseries as well. Uh, just to add on to that if you don't mind, Clay. Um, Next question is, what should we do about invasives in our riparian area? Uh, Cheryl, Cher, um, music, I'm sorry if I butchered that, uh, states we have a ton of Korean Lespedeza that has shown up along Lake Manassas. So Lespedeza, it's one of those where a lot of the Lespedeza that we have is what came about because it was an extremely effective anti-erosion control. Um, we have, we're fighting that over on, on a pond that we're restoring as well. And it, it takes, um, and actually the gentleman on the, you know, that's taking the call, Mike Miller with cooperative or with soil and water is a great resource because of his background. 
but it, it's oftentimes a, an, a, a process of cutting and spraying and cutting and spraying. Mike, I'm going to let you jump in on this one because you have a lot of experience with this one. Yeah, so and based a little bit on my background before I came to Northern Virginia, I was natural uh, restoration specialist, which means I restored uh, native uh, areas back to pre-European settlement. Uh, a lot of times with your invasives, it is it is a long process, and as Clay said, it's a mow before before seed sets and uh, treat it with some sort of herbicide according to the label. I can't stress that enough. It has to be specified for that plant and sprayed during a certain time. Uh, garlic mustard, as uh, garlic mustard as Alonzo uh, stated. You can actually spray that in the first year, but once it goes to a flowered section, you can spray Roundup on it and it doesn't affect it at all. So, um, yeah, it, it's a long process and spraying at the right time with the right herbicide, uh, it really matches kind of to that right plant, right place, uh, right herbicide, right time. And I know probably some of this is disillusioning because we're in, you know, we're talking about plant natives, but we're encouraging to spray herbicides. That's the unfortunate thing with some of the of combating these natives is, um, you know, you have, well, you don't have to, but oftentimes some of the most effective ways, unfortunately, is we have to resort to some, that's one of the really unfortunate things about fighting native, non-native species is just the, the goals and the techniques. So, um, uh, okay, next question. Uh, I'm gonna. You, some plants you can pull, like gar native, uh, garlic mustard. During yeah, the I've, spring, I've knocked that down on my own. I've actually been successful to get out there and pull it, make my kids pull it. <laughs> you, that is a very good one to pull. But when you start dealing with stuff with like bull, bull thistle that has this long cat fruit, I'm not. I don't. I'm not a proponent of spraying everything. Very specific spot treatments, because uh, you don't want to kill the good stuff alongside it. Uh, so our next question is from Justin Manzo, and he see and he says, "I see a white foam building up in some parts of my creek, where it widens and slows down. You had it in one of your pictures. Is that a result of runoff, and is it a sign of a problem?" Okay, a lot of times you will see, particularly in streams, um, you are going to see white foam looks almost like bubble bath, um, and that actually is a natural process because. As material breaks down, um, you, one of the reactions that will happen is sort of this aeration. So oddly enough, that is a, is a normal function and it should dissipate. Typically, uh, you'll, you'll get a cluster of algae and particularly with flowing water, you'll get a lot of aeration. And it's almost, it's almost like a soap in terms of, of the way, but it's not soap, it's a natural occurring function. Now in the picture that you saw, that was actually more of a scum. So it tends to be sort of a lower profile and not quite as bubbly. So if the stuff that you're seeing in the stream is very bubbly, that's actually a natural process as opposed to the scummy stuff on a pond. Okay. Uh, next question is from Katie Johnson. Uh, if the goal of the RPA is, is fully vegetated, is there a limit on what you can plant in an RPA, if there's also a sewer easement. So yeah, sewer easements, um, so sewer easements, the, their goal is to keep all woody vegetation out of it. Uh, they don't, and they have the right to do that. That's considered a utility. That's an exempt use within the, um, within the RPA. I can't do anything about it. So, and their goal is no, no woody vegetation. It's going to be the same as embankments on stormwater ponds. Um, they don't want the woody vegetation because it either compromises or it just takes a lot of money. Now, however, though, um, and I, 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 some of my graduate work I dealt with in power lines is that's actually a fascinating area where some of the more meadow species, the warm season grasses, and those warm season meadow plants and forbs, that's actually an off, a, a place, a good place for them to be. It's sort of a gap. Oftentimes, you know, our woodland, our, Prince William County is meant to be entirely wooded. It's, that's just temperate forest. That's what it's supposed to be. But we get these native grasslands, we get these gaps. So if you do have that easement through there, 
one of the things to think about is what are those warm season grasses or warm season forbs that can go in that area? They're going to be herbaceous uh, because that's the only thing that they're going to allow you. They're going to come along every once in a while and they're going to mow things down. But the nice thing about a lot of those warm season forbs is they like that. They need that as part of their disturbance ecology. So, uh, you know, kind of, yeah, it's going to be one you're going to have to shift your aesthetic and think about what can I do in this area and still sort of achieve that goal. All right. So sacrifice the riparian buffer because that's part of the easement or what? It, nothing's holding the stream bank together except for invasives right now. So I'm kind of struggling on what can I yeah, do this, to hold it together? Yeah, that's the unfortunate problem is because so much of the sewer lines are, are gravity fed. So they're gonna be in the lowest part of the landscape so you can work outside of the easement. So typically the understanding just how big the easement is and then on the outside of the easement, and then it's trying to determine where the, where the erosion is happening. Is it washing off? You know, is it, is, it, is it the water coming above and washing across that and entering the stream? Then can you create on the outsides of the easement, can you create a more woody area with the invasives themselves? And then it's a balance then of you get in there and you fight the in the invasives, but then all of a sudden you have all this bare soil. That's another unfortunate, uh, one of the tricks of trying to restore the RPA is getting rid of one thing and then trying to get something else in there while holding off the, the erosion. Um, I'm, I, I'm sorry, I don't have a more definitive answer, it, but it, it's just one of those that can be a bit challenging. Thank you. Uh, so a couple of you have said the, the link on the screen does not work. Uh, Clay, that was a link to the survey, correct? In the uh, chat. Oh, uh, that well, that link is from is Plant Nova Natives. Okay. That, um, if nothing else, go into Plant Nova Natives and well, in, yeah, visit that website in general. And then I think if you Google it, that should pull up. I'm sorry, Margaret Fisher sent that to me. It might still be in development. Maybe when they brought it up when they went live, it might have changed. I just did that recently. Um, also, you can you can reach out on the on the invasive issue. Uh, I highly recommend reaching out to Cooperative Extension, uh, Tom Spoles, Nancy Berlin over there, or you can reach out to myself at Prince William Solar and Water Conservation District. You can reach out to Clay or Julie. Uh, we all collaborate together, and uh, that is part of our organization's uh, one of our missions and goals to help landowners with. So um, feel free to, and that's in the partner order, uh, partner organization um, descriptions. Uh, so the next question is from Linda Irvin. Arvin, uh, I'm sorry if I butchered that. What is the best way to, way to reach out to lakefront residents to educate them into creating a healthy riparian buffer? Very good question. That's a great question. I have done mailings. So my, I do yearly mailings of, I've done so to people along the Occoquan and also to Lake Montclair. And honestly, I am in sore need of this becoming a, a community led thing. One of the best appeals that I feel, and you know, this comes from those that are, you know, I'm regulatory. So, you know, I, 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 I bear the gun and I, you know, I come, oh, I, not literally, but in terms of, you know, it's violations and really coming after people to the letter of the law. But what's going to really happen, what's going to really change is going to be this, it's got to be community driven. Um, and oftentimes, you know, people, again, there's this aesthetic that they have, or they just really don't care about the nature. So one of the conversations I've had with a lot of residents of Lake Montclair, you know, one of the, you know, I mentioned somebody used to call as so the lake's turning green, what are you going to do about it? I'm like, well, I go down there, I see all these manicured lawns right to the very edge of the stream. And I'm like, what are you going to do about it? Because that's, you know, here's how, this is where algae comes from. It's not something for me to do. You know, if you destroy RPA, then I have something. If it's already destroyed because of the age of development, then there really isn't anything for me to do. This has got to be this has got to be the community deciding that a lake is a shared asset. I know Lake Montclair just recently dredged the lake. It was an exorbitant amount. Well, you know where all this, <laughs> you know where these things are coming from. So 
Um, there's a numerous resource. I am more than happy to come. I've done it uh, to come and present, you know, invite me to come and present to your organizations or to your HOAs. But it's really just a matter of somebody taking the leadership and making the decision that this is important to them and then and just keep driving it home to their communities. I just got the message that the breakout session will end in one minute. So uh, I'm going to answer Justin's question real quick. Mm -hmm. the, I'm going to say, does the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Act allow for gradual re restoration of buffer zones? It is going to be a gradual uh, restoration. Restoration is a process and it is not an overnight thing. No, I mean, to make it overnight, you're going to have a failure somewhere, especially if you have invasives. And if you figure out how to do that, I'll help you write the book. <laughs> um, but we will be asked to transition here in about 30 seconds. I would like to thank Clay for this presentation. It was wonderful. Uh, and I'd like to thank everybody here for, for joining us and for your wonderful questions. And a um, reminder that you have about five minutes. This is your get another yes. cup of coffee in between. So Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Clay. And thank you, everybody. And we'll see you in the next sessions.